Welcome to History Bits, the place to learn a bit of history. In this series, we are going to explore the events of what some historians classify as the first terror attack in history, the bombardment of Copenhagen during the Napoleonic Wars, as well as the events that led up to this dire deed. Today, we will cover the end of the Fourth Coalition War, so stay tuned. The year is 1806. The French armies have defeated near all opposition in Central Europe. The Russians are still at war with Napoleon and have been pressured to the limit. Napoleon and his army stand at the doorstep into Russia in Eastern Prussia. The Prussians themselves have already been crushed at the battles of Jena and Outstead, leading the Russians to a lonesome war against Napoleon and his grand army. But Russia was not in this war all by themselves. They had an ally whom had been at war with France for even longer than they had. The English. However, the English were nowhere to be seen. Tsar Alexander looked hopefully towards the British Isles and pleaded for a British diversion to strike the French, as well as a loan of five million pounds. And as the Tsar and his people awaited the British reply, they could do little else than fight Napoleon the best they could. England was not without its own problems at the time, as Prime Minister William Pitt fell ill and died in the early months of 1806. This led to a government coalition consisting of William Grenville as the new Prime Minister and Charles James Fox as Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. Grenville had earlier in his career been part of Pitt's supporters, but had a few years prior denied the support and made his own political party. Grenville's new comrade, Fox, had also earlier been in the opposition to Pitt, but now these two men had a chance to do things their way, at least for a short while. Fox died in September of 1806, only a half year after the new government was formed, carving the path for Pitt's old supporters to regain control of government. And thus rose yet another William, also known as the Duke of Portland, to the seat of Prime Minister. He appointed a man named George Canning to be his Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, and so Canning finally set the reply to Russia in motion. As seen, the British government wasn't very stable at the time, and the relations with Russia had deteriorated over the few years they had been allies. Nonetheless, the new Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs was not about to lose England's only great power ally on the continent. He recruited the former diplomat for Russia, Granville Levson Gower. Gower had earlier been part of establishing the alliance with Russia, the alliance that was now wavering. Canning's hope was that the former work of Gower could be redone and ties with Russia secured. For this task, Canning wrote a small book on about a hundred pages for Gower on how to proceed with his talks as well as what Great Britain was able to help the Russians with. Canning's work turned out to be the work of a true politician, and the whole thing turned out to be very vague, and none of the pleas that Russia had made to the British would truly be answered like Tsar Alexander would have expected. Gower himself was not too interested in his role as a diplomat. More so, he was interested in a woman he had met on his earlier trip to Russia a few years ago. Gower was not in line to his family's fortune, so he had to marry into a wealthy family, and so he dreamt of the Russian princess Galitsyn. But there was just one problem with Gower's plan. First, the princess would have to get rid of her inconvenient husband. Gower was, so to speak, on a mission to set both Europe's as well as his own affairs in order. Due to Gower having to be re-elected for parliament, he could not leave London before the 19th of May 1806. Meanwhile, the Russians had not lost all hope, as General Bennigsen had earlier that year defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Iolau. His victory 
bought the Russians much needed time, and things were somewhat quiet until the 10th of June, where Bennigsen once again won against Napoleon in the Battle of Heilsberg. The day before Bennigsen's second victory against the time's most prestigious general, Gower had finally arrived in the Prussian port of Memel. He did not stay in Memel long though, and two days later he arrived in Tilsit where he had an audience with Tsar Alexander. A long-awaited audience from both sides. The audience though did not turn out as Gower had predicted. Not at all. Gower had barely finished speaking about the vague promises he had been told to parlay upon the Tsar, before Alexander became furious with the poor help the English wished to give him. His biggest complaint was that the whole burden of this war had been put onto Russia's shoulders and that England even refused or only vaguely promised any form of diversion. Nothing had happened. England had simply sat watching as the French encroached towards Russia's borders. Alexander also used this moment to shame England about the loan of five million pounds they had refused him and Gao could do little to mend the wounds. The only consolidation the Tsar gave Gao was that he would never surrender to Napoleon. He would rather pull back to Kazan or Tobolsk. When the audience was done, Gao was not particularly happy with how it had turned out, and rightly so, as this would prove to be the last time Gao got an audience with anyone meaningful during these crucial weeks. The day after Gao's audience with Alexander, General Bennigsen arrived at the town Friedland. His army drove off a small French division and took a few prisoners. Bennigsen set up camp across the river Alle with his army, and it seemed to him that this would be a quiet day. Little did he know that he would soon make the biggest mistake of his career. General Bennigsen was one of Russia's greatest generals. A few years earlier, when Alexander's father, Paul I, still sat on the throne, his son contemplated how he could dethrone his father. What was meant not to be a murderous plot turned out to be one anyway, and Paul I was disposed by being killed. Bennigsen was one of the men behind the act, and where many others were removed from their administrative position, Bennigsen, on the other hand, was pardoned. When Bennigsen had defeated the French armies a few months earlier in the Battle of Iolau, he had received the highest honors that the Russian Empire could bestow upon anyone, the Order of Saint Andrew. But on this day, Bennigsen would lose all the prestige he had gained, as he made the most disastrous choice possible. The French prisoners were brought before Bennigsen, where they were interrogated. They told him that the French forces around Friedland was only a small force, which was true. Furthermore, they said that Napoleon was on his way to Königsberg with most of his grand army. This however was not true. Bennigsen did not question the prisoners' credibility and sent most of his army of 46,000 men across the Alle River to set up camp on the open fields outside Friedland. It took his army several hours to cross the river, and now the army was positioned in an open field with the river at their back. While the Russian army was positioned in the open field, the French army of about 10,000 outside Friedland was positioned up a slope in a forest. They could easily hide from the Russians, but the Russians had little chance to keep track of their enemy. It did not take the French long to spot the Russian movements, and the general stationed at Friedland immediately sent word to Napoleon, who was about 20 kilometers away in the town of Yolau. When Napoleon heard the news, he quickly mounted his horse and galloped towards Friedland. And as he passed his troops, he shouted, Today's a blessed day, the anniversary of Marengo. The Battle of Marengo had occurred on the same day as this one, seven years earlier. When Napoleon reached Friedland, he ascended a hilltop 
where he could see the battlefield ahead of him. Napoleon could not believe his own eyes when he saw that Bennigsen had led his army into an open field with a river in their back. At first he was cautious and thought that this was a trap, but when he received word from one of his generals that Bennigsen's army was still crossing the Alle River, he sent word for reinforcements. Today Napoleon would get his revenge on Bennigsen. As the day slowly passed by, Bennigsen realized that Napoleon was preparing to strike him on the open field. He realized his error and probably cursed his own decision. He could not pull back at the moment. It had taken his army five hours to cross the river, and if they began now, Napoleon would certainly strike. There was no other way than wait for the dark of night and attempt to retreat across the river without the French knowing. But, as fate would have it, Bennigsen was not this lucky. It was in the late afternoon that Napoleon's reinforcements had arrived and set up position, and shortly after, 80,000 French soldiers came rushing down the slope towards the Russians on the open field. It was a bloody battle for the Russians, and they quickly wavered. Many who had tried to retreat by swimming across the river drowned due to the heavy weight of their garments. Cannons rained fire down upon the Russians, and when the Russians had finally retreated across the Alle River, they had lost 16,000 men, whereas the French had only lost half of that. The Russians had been crushed this day, and their morale would shortly after hit rock bottom. Join us next time where we will see what happened to the remaining Russian force and how the Tsar of Russia reacted to this colossal defeat.